Tonight, I take a, a very special pleasure in introducing the speaker. Uh, a number of you know Amanda Olke uh, because she is our adult education director, and the programs that many of you have come to through the years have been put together by Amanda. Not just programs like this, but Spy in the City and the Spy City Tours. Amanda was a real linchpin in the creation of the James Bond exhibit, which I hope you all have had a chance to tour. So I, I'm just, uh, I've depended so much on her through the years, it's a pleasure to introduce her. Uh, Amanda is um, <clears throat> a graduate of George Washington University and has a master's in uh, arts and teaching in museum education. Uh, she was previously the uh, executive director of the Museum Trustee Association and also public programs coordinator for the National uh, Building Museum. Uh, she uh, has given presentations of this nature before on some of the ranking spots. One that I remember quite well was one you did at an international conference, and that was Josephine Baker, which I remember was very successful. Uh, you ha may have noticed, by the way, that we have a very special guest here this evening, and I will let Amanda introduce her. So. Please help me welcome our own Amanda Olke. Well, good evening. It's wonderful to come downstairs so I didn't have to worry about a commute to speak to you about Wallace Simpson, and it really should say the Duchess of Windsor, but I think many of us are used to hearing her just called Wallace Simpson. Um, I was reminded over the weekend of, of the romance of Wallace. I said to a very, very young lady of my acquaintance, did you know there was once an English king who gave up, a gave up his throne for the woman he loved? Well, she's eight, so she said, was it me? And <laughs> I said, no, but he would have given it up for you. But I, I thought, oh, it reminded me of, of what a romantic story. Uh, this was to me when I first heard it. So if you'd like to hold on to the romance, you can leave now. Laura will refund your money. Otherwise, stick around and we'll talk a little bit more about what these, um, what these wonderful Windsors were really like. If I can get my, my PowerPoint to work. There we go. All right, we have, um, just give you a very quick overview. Of course, the Prince of Wales, very handsome, very beloved in England. He's gorgeous. He's sophisticated. He's, you know, everyone's idea of a, a fabulous international playboy. Um, he served in World War I. He looks like he's going to be a, a pretty good king. He's a great heir apparent. Uh, lots of girlfriends, um, but he really seems to specialize in married women. He has a, and some of them say nasty things about him after they're dropped. We'll get to that later. But he's, you know, managing to go along, never, never really finding the right girl until in 1930, he meets uh, Wallace Warfield Simpson, a Baltimore um, socialite. Uh, Wallace has had really a, a rough time uh, for someone who's been educated at the finest school in Baltimore. She married young, um, was divorced. This is her, by the time she meets uh, Prince Edward, she's in her second marriage to a, a rather nice English uh, shipping businessman, half English, half American. They're pretty happy, but they're living well beyond their means. They're climbers. She loves the access. She's so excited um, when she realizes that the sister of one of her friends is the prince's particular favorite at that time. She's thrilled to meet him. She says, we're finally taking the plunge. She writes a lot to her, um, to her aunt back in Baltimore. She's like, we, you know, we finally met him. Lots of excitement. Uh, they're moving in pretty terrific circles. This is her being presented at court in 1931, and I, she's got on some borrowed clothes and then these fabulous jewels. She's got on a huge cross. She always has incredible panache. People are, are always taken with what she's wearing. So she meets him in 1930. By 1934, she's his one and only, although she's married. 
Um, he, uh, the prince is really quite besotted with her. He's dropped his other lady friends and uh, the government begins to worry. And uh, the famous, probably fictitious China dossier comes into the picture. And this is an assemblage, supposedly, of all the things that Wallace did when she was in China, uh, married to her first husband. She, um, she did indeed associate with um, the Italian expatriate community, uh, one of the people who becomes useful to her throughout um, the next 10 or 15 years is ultimately Mussolini's son-in-law. She has affairs with Italian aristocrats. She also, this is where, you know, mixing with all sorts of interesting people, and they say also frequenting bordellas where she learned from these incredible ladies that work there how to hot up men. That's one of my favorite <laughs> phrases from, a, from an English scholar, hotting up men. And uh, all sorts of techniques because, you know, they've got techniques apparently in China that, that uh, none of us know about. Um, so I don't know. We can all take a trip at some point. So uh, anyway, the, um, the China dossier is out there. They're working, you know, the government is trying to track down, is she, you know, who is she really? What kind of force is she going to be? What kind of control is she going to ex exert over the prince? She is, um, meanwhile, she's very friendly with Ribbentrop, who is Hitler's envoy in London. She has lunch with him frequently. He sends her enormous bouquets of flowers. She's, you know, she's seen as someone of importance. She, um, you know, she has access to the prince. And then he becomes king in January of 1936. Before his father dies, he's, the king says, the boy will ruin himself within a year. So dad was totally behind him. And um, he you know, does seem to his ministers like he's going to ruin himself and maybe take the country with him. He seems to have very little um, patience with uh, typical conventions, with um, constitutional protocol. He is uh, gadding about a bit. He has, he has Wallace with him watching some of the important um, aspects of the opening of, um, of his reign. It's really quite scandalous. And then in the summer of 36, they go on this cruise around the Mediterranean. And she's a married woman. They're, they're cruising on the Nolan. One of his um, one of his aides said, you know, I love him as a man, but I can't stand him as a king. You know, he's like, to see the king capering around in short pants and golden crosses and, you know, it just didn't feel kingly, I guess. So, you know, things are getting out of control. This, um, for the government, the cruise is not publicized um, in the English press, but around the, the world, you know, the American papers know about Wallace and her relationship with the king and um, you know, and who, who has access to her and what access do you have to, to the king through her. Oops, back, sorry about that. Her, um, and her life becomes very difficult. Um, she really liked, I'm sorry Wallace if I'm speaking out of turn about you, but just try not to listen to the bad parts. She loved jewelry, she was always worried about money, her childhood had been um, one of precarious financial circumstances, so, and her husband and she had been living beyond their means, so she's really kind of excited to have the gifts and the access that she's getting from the king, but now it's beginning to be too much, and this is actually a diagram that was just released about 10 days ago from the National Archives in Britain, and it shows the, the police beat around her home because she is under, uh, you know, she, there had been a possible bomb threat. Her life may be in danger. So she is getting, she is beginning to think, you know, maybe it's time we dial this back. And I think she felt, this is my interpretation from my readings, that she was going to gamble and lose everything. She was going to lose a husband that she rather loved. There was no way she was really going to get to be queen. I don't think she wanted to be queen. I think she enjoyed being a favorite. And now her life is in danger. Her marriage is, you know, is a ruin. And what is to become of her? Well, Edward would not take no. 
he was going to marry her. And he suggests several different possibilities, a morganatic marriage where he could be married to her, but any children that they would have wouldn't be in the succession. But he is truly outmaneuvered by his government, who've begun to feel like he's a little too interested in new regimes. He um, hasn't shown very good judgment. Also, as the de facto head of the Church of England, he, is, uh, he can't be married to her. Um, the Church of England did not recognize marriage to divorced people where the, the divorced spouse was still living. So he signs the Articles of Abdication in December. And I'm going to give you, I've whittled down his abdication speech just to give you a little taste of Edward at this time. I am able to say a few words of my own. I have never wanted to withhold anything. But until now, it has not been constitutionally possible for me to speak. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. And now that I have been succeeded by my brother, the Duke of York, my first words must be to declare my allegiance to him. This I do with all my heart. You all know the reason which have impelled me to renounce the throne. But I want you to understand that in making up my mind, I did not forget the country or the empire, which as Prince of Wales and lately as King, I have for 25 years to serve. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And I want you to know that the decision I have made has been mine and mine alone. This was a thing I had to judge entirely for myself. The other person most nearly concerned has tried up to the last to persuade me to take a different course. I have made this the most serious decision of my life only upon the single thought of what would in the end be best for all. And now, we all have a new king. I wish him and you, his people, happiness and prosperity with all my heart. God bless you all. God save the king. Okay, I think it's a good speech, and that's about five minutes cut out of it, but we got the high points, and I really feel like when he says she was persuading me to take a different course, she was scrambling to try to get out of there because this is looking like a pretty scary prospect. A, a king who stepped down, the loss of her marriage. Uh, she actually, in print, said that she would give him up um, while she, she was really a hunted animal at this point by the international press. 
So the king, um, the former king, has really been outmaneuvered uh, by the church, by the government, um, sort of what's, who is he to be now? And I think he envisioned a, a more powerful role for himself, but he's the incredibly popular former king. And I mean, imagine your, your older brother's still hanging around and now you're king and everybody likes him better. So, you know, they don't really want to keep him. And I don't blame the new king, it's pretty tough stuff. And um, also he's very sad because he badly wanted Wallace to be her royal highness. And, they would not grant that to her. The, the um, palace would not give her that honorific. Um, so here's the former king and emperor. Now he's the subject of not very appealing holiday cards of that winner. Uh, this one refers to a comment a former girlfriend had put around about, um, well, you can figure it out. So um, what, are, what are they going to do? What are the newlyweds going to do? You know, they're rattling around. Um, actually, they're not the newlyweds yet because Wallace's final divorce is not final. Uh, so she is on, on the Riviera, staying with friends, the Rogers. You know, is everything going to be for naught? Um, the king, the former king now, the Duke of Windsor, is hanging out in Austria. Uh, he has very, uh, you know, very strong feelings for Germans and Austrians. His family has close uh, familial relationships. And um, he has liked what he's hearing about the new regime in Germany. But they can't be together because they can't mess up the divorce process. There's some fun uh, pre-wedding PR. I love this picture. Cecil Beaton took this. This is to soften Wallace, you know, kind of get rid of the China dossier aspect of her, more the, the romantic. Uh, bride to be, and I love it because this dress, this lovely, you know, kind of toolish dress, it's got a lobster on it. I mean, she's just <laughs> not a soft, cuddly person. And she said, I could never be pretty, so I wanted to be sophisticated, and, and indeed she was. Um, it, it did finally become clear that they were going to be able to marry. And where were they going to do this? And this is when this very interesting couple steps into the picture. Fern and Charles Badeau, uh, he is a millionaire. He's a, a Frenchman who's lived in the United States. He has an international company. Fern is his Grand Rapids, Michigan socialite wife, his second wife. He met her uh, during one of his trips to the United States when he was conducting some espionage work during the First World War. He was an industrial expert. He kind of comes out of nowhere and is, um, you know, ends up being advisors to Ford, to DuPont, you know, Standard Oil, all the big companies. And, you know, of course, the people hated him, labor movements hated him, because he showed up and, you know, we can do this and we can do that and we can automate this and you don't need all this staff. But he is very successful, and he's also someone who is known, the FBI, he was on the FBI's radar in the 19-teens, taking photographs of factories that he visited, conducting the blueprints, reporting back to Germany. Strong ties to Germany. Anyway, he's incredibly wealthy. He knows, um, he socially knows the Americans that uh, Wallace is taking refuge with. And he suggests that his and Fern's uh, a fabulous chateau could be a great location for the Duke and Duchess's wedding. I mean, he just wants a little PR out of it. That's really what he says. I, and he also wants some access to the former king of England. So the Duke and Duchess are finally reunited. This is the day before their wedding, which they agree to have at the Badeau's home. For some reason, uh, British intelligence, even though he was, he was on the screen as a person of question, nobody thought that it was odd that they were going to marry at his house. And of course, you know, it's, it's a hard occasion for them. None of his family will come, but we're, you know, we're hopeful. Things are looking up, as I say. And here I'm, I'm going to subject you to a little royalty and wedding porn. We're going to watch. We're going to watch uh, some footage.
Look at those hips. Thanks for your patience. I love that. That was the top song of 1937, Fred Astaire singing that, so I thought it would be an appropriate song to go along um, with the, the wedding photographs. And I love seeing them actually interact because they sort of become more real and the way they're laughing. So okay, what does a former king and his new wife do on their honeymoon? Okay, all right, let's head over to Italy. It's kind of a burgeoning fascist regime. Uh, let's mix around a lot with people, see what kind of mischief we can get into. Um, this first bullet point is uh, referring to an incident at the Brazilian embassy where the American ambassador received a secret message indicating that a train crash had revealed, stay with me people, had revealed that um, there were naval shells being transported from Germany to Italy on a train, which was breaking international law. Um, the Duke of Windsor sees Messer Smith, the American ambassador, receive this message. He asks what it's about. Messer Smith uh, shows it to him. And then the next day, Americans intercept a secret message where the Italians are communicating that this is found out. So he's a loose lipped kind of guy. And he definitely um, drinks a lot, says things he shouldn't have, or maybe things that he wants to. Uh, they're both very, very interested in fascism. They think it's terrific. They're hanging out with her old friends uh, from, um, from China, um, just kind of keeping, um, keeping their all sorts of contacts alive. The Duke always seems ready to give any kind of salute that anyone wants him to. This is always suppressed as much as it can be. I could not find a photograph of that. What do you do for an encore? OK, well, Germany seems really exciting this time of year. So let's head over and hang out with the Nazis a little bit. And keep in mind, he really, the, the Duke was imagining that he was going to have a role on the grand stage. He's, you know, he's been the emperor. He's been the king. And so he's used to state visits. And the, the Badeaus, Charles and Fern Badeau, Charles cooked this trip up. He's like, oh, he's operating now. He's like, I've got, I've got the Duke of Windsor in my pocket. I can get him over to Germany. This is going to be an amazing coup for me to connect, um, to connect Hitler and other major Nazis uh, with the Duke. So this is, I swear to you, the last video and a short one. I love the videos, but this is the last one. This is uh, the Duke and Duchess arriving in Germany.
I got to tell you people, right now, someone somewhere is writing a historical novel about the little girl that gave flowers to the Duke of Windsor at a Nazi concert. Anyway, that's all I can think about that. Um, they arrive. Um, Wallace uh, rests at the hotel. The Duke immediately goes on a tour with Ley, who is the head of the German labor front. You know, he supervises troops. He whips out, you know, one of his fabulous salutes, uh, always a crowd pleaser. Uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, not, you know, not published in England. You know, he's touring around. He's very impressed with the efficiency, with what he sees. Um, he enjoyed Lay, but he thought he told a lot of off-color jokes. He visited with Goring, who was um, uh, the, the founder of the Gestapo. And Goring had in one of his rooms this map of Europe, and it had England was still England, but then Germany was pretty much everything over here. And the Duke said, well, isn't that a little impertinent and a little premature? And Goring said, it's faded. It must be. And, and the Duke kind of let it roll. But so clearly, you know, it's not just he's, he's seeing what the Germans have in mind. Uh, Wallace joins him in succeeding days. She looks a little less impressed with the tour. Uh, but she had comments as well. Uh, she found Hess, the deputy Fuhrer, Fuhrer, to be charming of manner and good looking. Himmler, the chief of German police, um, was a, what did he, he was, he had a bespectacled meekness and the appearance of a clerk caught up in politics. And uh, Goebbels, the Reich Minister of Propaganda, was a wispy gnome with an enormous skull. But so they, you know, and they toured, the Duke toured concentration camps. They were political prisoners. So they were not, you know, at the height of uh, what we are, we think of in concentration camps. But, you know, and it was, it was uh, shiny and efficient. And that really appealed to the Duke, unfortunately. Then finally, exciting times. They're, they're off to meet Hitler in his mountain retreat in Ober Salzburg, and everybody has a, has a great time. The Duke and Hitler um, spend some um, quality time together discussing, you know, things that we can speculate on, like, you know, when I take over, you can go back and be king of England. I'm just saying that's speculation. Uh, and a lot of people speculate that. They have a, a good meeting. Uh, Wallace is particularly taken, uh, apparently, with the swastika, decor swastika decorated pillows that he had at the lodge. An eye for photos. It's good looking stuff, apparently. I tried desperately to find photos, but I could not. And it was just, it was considered really uh, to, to the Windsors a great trip very successful, and then they planned to go from here on to the United States. And at this point, they are seen as truly a destabilizing element um, in world affairs. The Duke is operating uh, with kind of old news from when he stepped down uh, as king. He's no longer in the loop. Uh, he thinks he's buying the, the German story, hook, line, and sinker. And he liked this ta a state visit and getting, he loved to show Wallace off and he wanted people to love her. And Hitler apparently said after they left, she would have made a good queen. And um, so he was enjoying getting to be back in the center of attention. And so with their friends, the, the Bedows, who are, this is them all at the um, Bedows Hungarian estate, explaining the short pants and, um, Badal was now planning an American tour for the Duke, and you know, England's kind of like, hold on, this is not going to work. They are interfering. We don't know what kind of deal making is going on. You know, she's possibly always been in the Germans' pockets. The Duchess would write to the Duke at some point, you know, making jokes about about the fact that she was considered a spy, and. Um, and it just seems like it's going to be terrible if they go to the United States. They're so pro-Germany. The Duke is interested in new regimes. And Badeau really pays for trying to organize this American tour because it is canceled. And they do not go. And he actually loses 
Um, he loses control of his own American branch of Badeau in, um, International because there's such a backlash and he, there's so much scandal around him at this point that his own company says you need to step down and be a silent partner. So now, back to what are we going to do? You know, he had envisioned um, a role for them on an international stage. Um, they take up residence in, in Paris in a, in a beautiful place and get lots of fabulous jewelry together and work on staying really slim and really fashionable. And uh, in spring of 1939, um, the Duke makes a broadcast in support of world peace. He truly, at this point, he had a horror of war that um, developed from World War I. He just, and he hated the idea of Germany and England being at war. He said, we are both of Hun origin. This is, this is not right. It can't be. And he always felt like there was going to be some way to broker peace. And, um, and he saw himself as kind of an international peace leader. And uh, so this, this radio broadcast from Verdun in France was never another not heard in Britain. So war breaks out. The Duke and Duchess are at their fabulous home in La Croix on the French Riviera. The Duke comes out and says to Wallace and his best friend, Fruity Metcalf, you know, this statement, he's terrified about communism coming, but then he dives into the pool, so things got better. That's what Fruity said. But he, he does want to be part of the British mission. He lobbies, um, he lobbies for a role and um, is assigned to the British mission in France. Um, and he wants to retain his rather honorific title. And there's a, a dance around that. But he gets the title of Major General. Uh, and he is reporting at the British mission to another major general, but who has real experience. And, um, and that is uh, uh, Major General um, Howard Vise who actually sees the king as, or the former king, as a godsend because he's feeling like his mission in France, he's kind of hogtied, he can't get anywhere, and he thinks, oh, well, if I have this rather prominent person, maybe I can gain some access. So he, he uses the Duke's presence in his party to lobby the French for the opportunity to tour the French lines. And he's very artful about it, and he says, you know, oh, God, I'm saddled with this guy, and we need to do something with him. Maybe we can do a morale-boosting tour. So Howard Vise is, is pretty happy about that. Meanwhile, the Duke and Duchess, you know, despite the Badaus ties, really known ties, back and forth to Germany, back and forth to Berlin, all over the place. Fruity says, you know, I don't know where he is. He knows everything. You know, he's a frightening person. And not really who you want top, uh, top people from, um, from uh, your country mingling with while we're at war, while England's at war with Germany. But finally, they do indeed make the tour of the French lines. And this is the, the Duke's tour, I should really just say, in oct early October, not just one specific date, you know, but traveling all along the French lines. And he particularly noted that here in, in Sedan, things are very weak. Things look very weak there. And that becomes important as we go on. So Fruity's getting scared. Fruity doesn't like what's going on. They feels like they're spying on him. They're all probably being spied on. They're spying on each other. Fruity's a real military man, and somehow he's ended up being equerry to the former king. He wanted to do it. It's his best friend. But now things happen like, Fruity, do you really have to take your servant because I need space in the car for my stuff. Uh, like, literally, he had to rearrange his life so the king's royal teapot could go with him. I mean, it's just incredible, incredible stuff. Fruity just can't kind of believe what's going on, but he's accompanying the Duke. Wallace, uh, meanwhile, is, is doing her part. She's rolling bandages. But in France, in December of 1939, what's really pressing to the Duke and Duchess is the fact that their chef 
has been called up for the French war effort, and he's gone to the front. So they spend an awful lot of time pulling strings and influence, trying to get their chef assigned to their mess. So these are people that, you know, world peace, but good meals first. Um, very interesting priorities. Okay, Howard Vise begins to become concerned that there is way too much of an open channel uh, between Paris and Berlin, um, that Badeau may be carrying information between the king and um, high-ranking Nazis, even Hitler. And this is, I don't know, this may be hard to see, but um, these are comparing the original German war plan for marching into Belgium with a later one, which suddenly, and which, which is what they did, going through Sedan. And there are lots of people, if you'd like to read, who would suggest that this is based on what the Duke saw as he toured the lines and reported back to Hitler. Uh, there's one historian who has a letter that purports to be from, um, from the Duke of Windsor directly to Hitler, um, saying, believe what, you know, believe what the gentleman um, with this letter has to tell you. Um, and after the war, the German uh, minister in the Hague claimed that the Duke had uh, leaked the Allied war plans for the defense of Belgium. So we will probably never know 100%, but it doesn't look pretty. All right, so the bombs are falling, and England is being bombed, and the lovely comment that the Duchess has to say is, you know, after what they did to me, they deserve it. You know, the Duke is on record throughout the time. He's such a believer in the peace process that now he thinks, well, bombing's a good way to get peace. We're going to bomb my own, my own people into submission, and then they'll finally engage in really serious peace talks. Very, um, very interesting approach to peace, in my opinion. So. Paris is too dangerous for them to stay in. Wallace takes refuge at Le Palais, uh, Hotel de Palais in Biarritz. And then, this is fascinating, the German propaganda ministry goes on the radio and announces where she is in her room number. <laughs> and Wallace says, the Germans have played a most unchivalrous trick on me, which is a very intriguing comment. Because why in the world would she think they owed her anything? The countries are at war. Her husband's in the British mission. Uh, he's an officer. And, um, and yet, the Germans have played a terrible trick on him. Now, meanwhile, the Duke, who's supposed to be in uniform, supposed to be reporting back, he's taking Wallace to safety in Biarritz, coming back to Paris. And then he's like, you know what we really need to do? Um, now I'm going to get Wallace, and I'm going to go to our fabulous home in Nice. And, um, and at this point, there are people in England who are saying the, the Windsor should be brought to Paris for interrogation on their peculiar role in Nazi collaboration. So people are out there. They're, they're realizing that you know, he's, not, he's a loose cannon at best. So Churchill is saying, return to England, return to England. So they go to Madrid, yay. And um, Madrid is really scary prospect. Franco's leading it. It's another, you know, it's a fascist country, um, leanings towards Nazism. And um, here they are, um, they spend some valuable time uh, going through their former Italian channels to have their, um, their home in Nice guarded, even though it's now under the possession of Germany. Their, their home is never touched. And then the fabulous Cleopatra whim, uh, during an event, Wallace says to the American ambassador, Weddell, that she needs him to get the American consul um, in Nice to go to La Croix and get her green swimsuit, which she's left behind and might need. So, all right. And, and at this time, it's also rumored that Hitler knew more about their movements than Churchill. People are beginning to suspect that there's an idea of if Germany wins, you know, the Duke is going to come back as the leader of, of king of a newfangled England, a totalitarian England. All sorts of conspiracy theories are swirling, and, and they're not helping because they are, oops, sorry, 
They are staying at the Ritz in Madrid. They are not, you know, this is wartime, walking the dogs. They are not, you know, they're not returning to London. They're, they're not putting the stiff upper lip out. Another demand to return, here Winston Churchill's frankly threatening court-martial at this point. You are an officer in the British military. It's not quite enough. They have one more mad dash to Lisbon, where they stay in the fabulous home of a Nazi sympathizer, uh, Ricardo de Esperatu Santa Silva, beautiful home called the Mouth of Hell. And um, they visited with the German ambassador. There seemed to be steady trafficking. And at this point, I think you know, things got really heated for the Duke. Ribbentrop is make sure nothing happens to them. And then you start hearing rumors that the Duke and Duchess are going to be kidnapped and taken out of, of Lisbon. And they're, they're going to be secreted somewhere. But is the Duke working with them? Is Wallace working with them? You know, who's working for who? What is their real plan? Churchill is cabling wildly, saying, you've got to get back here. This is not working. And I think at this point, some of the um, people who were mingling with the Duke at that point said, he looks scared. He's probably like Wallace was right before the wedding. Oh, my God. I think he's the same. Way. Oh, my goodness. Am I going to go with the Germans and possibly be a king or a leader again? Or do I need, is it time to just tow the family line? Which, and he's still trying to get an HRH for Wallace out of his shenanigans. But ultimately, he sucks it up. He takes governorship of the Bahamas about as far from the action as we can get these folks. And, um, you know, I've heard all sorts of lovely comments. She's like, it's a nation of morons. You know, I, I only put in everything is so intensely dull here that the Duke said, because that one's well documented. I'm wondering if the swastika pillows influenced the Union Jack pillows. I, you know, I don't know. But they, they did a pretty good job in, in NASA from, um, actually from 41 until 1945, sorry about that date. But they were always intriguing. Uh, the Duke was mingling with a known Nazi sympathizer, a, a Swede millionaire who was changing money illegally. The Duke made tons of money off illegal transactions. Um, they, Wallace did a lot of power shopping when she could cop, hop over to the United States. Um, they made lots of comments about being watched and who was watching them. and. Um, one guest said that as they were piped in uh, to an event um, at the embassy, Wallace made a comment, and she said to the piper, and you can report that back to Downing Street, too. So they, um, they stepped down from this role in 1945, uh, and the, the Duke never served another in another official capacity. Now, one interesting side, uh, or final note to this story is that Anthony Blunt, one of the Cambridge Five, was in the MI5 at this time. And in 1945, or at the end of the war, he was sent with a royal librarian. He was also working in the libraries. And they were sent to pick up um, information from a German castle relating to um, the German Empress uh, Victoria. And there was a lot of speculation that, that there was no need to go and get correspondence from a, you know, from a, a former queen at that time. And it was really material back and forth between the Duke and Hitler that was being retrieved and covered up. And as people say, the palaces had centuries of covering up scandal. So this was, was not a big deal for them. And, um, Many disclaimers have been put out that the Duke never wavered in his loyalty, but I, I firmly believe that, that they were ready to take the best offer they could get. So, and those are unkind words for me to end on. So I'm going to invite a really wonderful guest to speak a little bit, maybe more in the defense of the Windsors this evening. We have the Duchess with us this evening. A few questions we'd like to ask you, if you will. Thank you. Well, I should hope, after all, that I should have some opportunity to defend myself. 
well, Wallace, we agreed on some um, preset questions because I know you don't like surprises unless they come in jewelry boxes. So I will, I will be good to my word and I will stick with the questions. All right. As a private person who became a figure on the world stage, how did you feel about suddenly being under intense scrutiny? Did it make you more or less cautious? Well, I do wish they had just left us alone. That was all we ever asked for. It was rather terrifying at times. I could hardly go anywhere without them following me around. My concern was never truly for myself, though it was always for His Royal Highness, for David, that he might be spared the embarrassment that they seemed insistent upon bringing him. Oh, that's very lovely. Um, would <laughs> Bad, Amanda. Would you have liked to be Queen of England? <laughs> I have always said that I never wish to be Queen. Such formality and so many rules and regulations that are required. But I do not see why they should have insisted that he could not remain King. Okay, you and your husband had a reputation for intrigue. I've gone over a little bit of that. In the days leading up to England's entry into war and in the first year of the conflict, why do you think that was? <laughs> well, I have really no idea why you would call it intrigue. David was accustomed to having a position of considerable importance on the world stage, and in the circles in which we moved, of course, such things were regularly discussed. You see, I firmly believe that he understood far before anyone else did that the true threat was not from Germany, but it was from the communists. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, did you enjoy your trip to Germany in oh. the 30s? And what did you think of Hitler and the Nazi party? We enjoyed it very much. They treated us far better than anyone in England did. We were quite impressed by the very beautiful buildings they had mm -hmm. and by the care they took of the working people. This was something that had been very dear to David's heart for some years, particularly his concerns when he had toured Wales and seen the poor workers there and those who had no jobs. And what was done in Germany was really quite impressive. And as for Hitler himself, I was very struck by him. He has the most magnetic eyes. Well, yours are pretty good too. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, okay, this one's a little blunter. How did it feel to be under suspicion as a spy? Well, how do you think it should feel? It was hardly pleasant at all. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> I thought maybe you'd like it. I don't know, glamorous or something. All right, during the first year of the war as you fled Paris for the French coast and on to Spain and Portugal, the stories have you partying, lots of receptions at the embassies, partying as though no war was happening. Why did you party on, Wallace? <laughs> well, we were not partying ourselves with merely the dogs. Everyone okay. was doing it. Okay. And of course, one would wish to keep morale up and encourage public spirits and so forth. We could not let them see any sort of weakness. All right, what if Germany and England had negotiated peace with your husband as English leader? Would you have liked that role? At what time do you mean? Now, was this after the fall of France, hypothetically? Well, yeah, let's say that. Personally, I don't think it was very likely, but David has been so confined. He has such great scope and so many abilities that I should think if there were some better way to make use of them, certainly we would have welcomed it. All right. Um, so what was that post like in the Bahamas towards the end of the war, or well, early in? <laughs> you mean our St. Helena? Yes. <sighs> it's dreadful. Stiflingly hot. The people are all lazy. We did our bit as best we could, but the few bright spots were when we had a chance to go to Miami and have some real fun. All right, well said, uh, as a party girl. Um, how, did, <laughs> how did the Duke feel about being branded a Nazi sympathizer in gossip after the war? And I guess during the war. Indeed. It seems there are 
certain factions, particularly in the press, and dare I say it, in the royal family, who have a consuming desire to discredit him, however possible. And I can only think that some of this malicious gossip was to that extent. They wish to make him look as terrible as they possibly can. No, he certainly did not enjoy it, although he does not speak of it, but I do think it has hurt him very deeply. Now, I have one last question that I'm going to ask before we turn this over for a few questions from the audience. What's up with the dogs, the pugs, the terriers? Why did you all love those little dogs so much? Well, who wouldn't love them? Aren't they charming? We had one canned terrier by the name of Slipper that was given to me as a gift by David before we were married. And then when we had to be separated until the divorce was finalized, he took Slipper with him, carried him under his arm. It was so good. I didn't miss both of them. All right. Well, you're a lovely person. And, <laughs> and we thank you for being here. Certainly. And I think we would be willing to take a few questions uh, from the audience, if anyone has any. Please wait for the mic. Or, or here's Laura. Where's my camera? Here you are. Thank you. Um, was your marriage uh, romantic and stellar until the end, or as I've read, it maybe had some difficulties? One cannot imagine how difficult it is to live out a great romance. <laughs> Though I'm rather perplexed by your question as to. <laughs> Until the end? Whatever do you mean by that? <laughs> we have both given up so much. And I think that if we did not have each other, it would hardly be bearable at all. Any other brave souls? <laughs> um, Kathy Culpin from the British Council at the British Embassy. Um, <laughs> there's an opening. Um, do you think there's ever been a woman in British history that's been as loathed by the British public <laughs> as you were? Well, I can only speak from personal experience, but no, I don't think so. <laughs> Anyone else? Someone right in front had a question? Laura? Yellow. Yes. Uh, can we just cut to the chase? Were you a spy? Or, <laughs> or did you just go after the highest bidder? <laughs> Madam, that is not very civilized. <sighs> it is true that perhaps sometimes David has been a bit more free with his words than he ought to be. But he has such a trusting character. Indeed, when I was still married to Mr. Simpson, we would often refer to him in our letters as Peter Pan. He is like a great boy sometimes. And if he speaks what is on his mind, well, it's merely his nature. Whether that should qualify either one of us as engaging in espionage, I do not think the term is merited. All right, well, I would like to step outside for just a second of our evening and say this is Emily Lapisardi, who's an amazing historical reenactor. But I know she's not going to step outside, so thank you for letting me do that. We are going to. I, we may not want to toast the values of the Duke and Duchess. Uh, we may just wish that we had more proximity to their jewels. But what we will have a chance to do is toast them. This is the gazillionth anniversary of your wedding. Sorry. And we have champagne for everyone who's come. And we'd like to invite you down. And we'll have a toast to the Windsors. I do realize that after all of this, I look 100 and weigh 110, but it is certainly not the gazillion thing. You do not look like you weigh 110, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Come on down, we'll have a drink. <laughs>